So welcome everyone to the cyanobacteria training for 2020. I'm Angela Shambaugh with the Vermont DEC Lakes and Ponds program. Uh, this training covers how we monitor for cyanobacteria on Lake Champlain and Vermont's inland lakes and how you'll upload that information to report it and share it through the Vermont Department of Health cyanobacteria tracking web pages. You'll find that the training is divided into three parts. Part one, which will which you're listening to right now, is going to cover general ecology of cyanobacteria. Part two discusses the visual assessment protocol that we use to evaluate how much cyanobacteria you're observing. And part three covers how to get that information from your report onto the Vermont Department of Health's tracker webpage. Returning volunteers can watch uh, part three only, but we do recommend that you might find some interest, uh, some new material in part one and part two. Those of you that are new volunteers should watch all three videos. And once you're done, please contact me, Angela Shambaugh, and let me know where you're going to be monitoring for cyanobacteria. Then we will get you the login and credentials that you need. All right, well, let's get started with part one. So cyanobacteria are photosynthetic organisms that can be found in a variety of, organ, a variety of environments around the world. They're also called blue-green algae, and if you uh, do a web search on either of these terms, you'll see that they're used interchangeably. Cyanobacteria is actually the most scientifically accurate term. Uh, cyanobacteria are classified with the bacteria and not with the, the uh, where the algae fall into the taxonomic system. Uh, so cyanobacteria is the term that we use because it's more accurate. You may also hear these organisms referred to as HABs or harmful algal blooms. Bloom is a non-scientific term used to describe a situation where there are a lot of a particular organism in one place. So there can be diatom blooms, uh, there can be dinoflagellate blooms called um, red tides in the ocean. There can be chrysophyte blooms known as golden algae uh, in the southern part of the U.S. Some of these blooms can also be harmful. The dinoflagellate red tides are harmful to people and animals as are the golden algae blooms. Um, I use the term HCB and others are beginning to use that term as well, harmful cyanobacteria bloom as a way to distinguish cyanobacteria from these other um, organisms they may, that are captured under that more generic term of harmful algal bloom. And the difference between cyanobacteria and the other phytoplankton and the other algae really comes down to its internal organization. Cyanobacteria and bacteria are prokaryotes. If you were to look at their cells underneath the microscope, you would see a homogeneous granular appearance. There's no uh, membrane-bound organelles within those cells. If you were to look at the cells of uh, other algae, of plants, and of you and I, we are all eukaryotes. We do have internal membrane-bound organelles. Looking at our cells underneath the microscope, you will see a nucleus, uh, you will see chloroplasts, and you will see other packages of materials. Our cells are, are um, very distinct looking when compared to prokaryotic cells. Cyanobacteria are ancient organisms. They've been around for millions of years. Uh, when folks like to refer to the primordial soup um, that was present on this earth uh, millions of years ago, I, I tend to think that that probably was a lot of cyanobacteria, and it didn't probably didn't look too different from what a dense cyanobacteria bloom looks like now. The image on the left here is fossilized uh, cyanobacteria colonies, large colonies fossilized, um, and the view is from a location in Australia, I believe. The image on the right is also from Australia. It's that exact same group of organisms, but those are living colonies now. Uh, very little difference between the live colonies on the right and the fossilized colonies on the left. Cyanobacteria have been with us for a very, very long time. Cyanobacteria are very diverse. Uh, we think of them as being found in lakes and ponds and rivers, uh, but they can be found in many environments. Uh, they grow on soil. Um, they grow in hot springs in the Arctic, um, many, many different places. Uh, the image on the right is the Grand Prismatic Hot Springs in Yellowstone National Park. Uh, 
uh, where the color rings that you see are in part due to the fact that cyanobacteria and other bacteria have very specific preferences for water temperatures and they grow where they can find the water temperature they like best. And because they organize themselves according to those temperatures and the water in the middle of the hot springs is the hottest and it gets cooler as you go out from the center, uh, you can see these rings of color that, that are, are due to them finding their exact favorite spot to grow. The image at the upper left is in the desert. Uh, that black material that you see there is what is known as the desert crust. It's a biologic, uh, biological community, uh, and a large component of that is cyanobacteria. The desert crust tends to form first on top of the desert sands and soils. After it's been there for a while, uh, there's enough organic material in place that other things like shrubs and trees can begin to grow. In the Arctic, the image on the, on the lower left there, um, you may find cyanobacteria growing on rocks and also on the soil. Um, so they're not just limited to uh, lakes and ponds. Cyanobacteria are a very important component of the environment. As an organism that conducts photosynthesis, um, they are taking sun energy, using that energy to uh, grow and then as they grow um, and become abundant, in turn, they are consumed by other organisms within the food web. And so that sun energy is transferred throughout the food web and allows a lot of different organisms to grow that um, are not directly harnessing that sun energy. Cyanobacteria are believed to have been the first organism to have figured out to do how to do photosynthesis. Um, and as a result, they became very abundant. Uh, the ability to, to do photosynthesis gave them an edge, uh, a competitive edge for other organisms at the time, and they became very, very abundant. Now, part of the process of photosynthesis releases oxygen to the atmosphere. Uh, before photosynthesis began, the atmosphere of Earth did not have a lot of oxygen in it. Uh, organisms did not breathe oxygen um, as we do now. But because photosynthesis gave cyanobacteria such a competitive edge and they became so abundant, um, they were releasing a lot of oxygen as a result of being able to do photosynthesis. And it changed the atmosphere to one that has a predominant amount of oxygen in it compared to what was there before. And so you and I, in a way, uh, uh, look as we are um, breathe as we do because uh, cyanobacteria changed the atmosphere to one that is dominated by oxygen. The, chlorop the, the process of photosynthesis, again, and was done in cyanobacteria. At some point, it's believed that another organism ate a cyanobacteria cell, but that cyanobacteria cell did not die, and over time continued to live within that organism and became uh, what we call chloroplasts now. It's a very complex process, but in two ways, cyanobacteria um, have very strongly influenced uh, our ability to survive um, through the production of oxygen and through the photosynthetic process. The other thing of interest, that's, the other uh, beneficial thing that cyanobacteria do is that they are also able to fix nitrogen. That means they can take nitrogen gas from the atmosphere, draw it into their cells, change it into their cellular material, and use it for growth. Uh, gardeners are aware that are, there are uh, some garden plants in the legume family, beans and peas being one of the most common ones, that have bacteria associated with their roots that can also do this. Um, again, nitrogen is something that's not very uh, abundant in the environment, and so when cyanobacteria can pull gaseous nitrogen out of the atmosphere, use it for cells, it can be transferred food through the food web when they are eaten by other organisms. There are many other ways that um, we're working to make uh, cyanobacteria uh, be helpful to us. Uh, on the upper left, you can see that um, there's a great amount of research going into using cyanobacteria for the production of biodiesels. Folks are also looking at how we might harness that ability to fix nitrogen and create a biofertilizer that doesn't require chemical nitrogen. And finally, the most recent thing that I saw um, is that scientists at the University of Colorado have figured out how to add bacteria and cyanobacteria to concrete 
uh, that makes that concrete more resilient, uh, can actually slightly repair itself, um, and is more uh, long-lasting in the environment. So there are many ways that cyanobacteria are beneficial to us in addition to uh, photosynthesis um, and oxygen production. Cyanobacteria are native. They're not invasive species. They're common to all environments across Vermont uh, and the U.S. and the world, not just watery environments, um, and they are a natural component of that environment. Uh, but we do talk about them because we are concerned about the, the ability to produce potent compounds that can be harmful to people and animals. We refer to, the, there are several groups of compounds that cyanobacteria can produce that may cause illness. Um, this slide here in the middle is from the USGS. Across the top, you can see four groups of uh, compounds that cyanobacteria produce that have impacts on, on people and humans. The first uh, is hepatotoxins, circled in green. These compounds affect the liver. The most common one uh, is microcystin, and we do detect microcystin in Vermont every year, uh, usually on Lake Champlain, but occasionally on other lakes as well. The group circled in orange, the neurotoxins, are compounds that can affect your nerve activity. Um, we do not find them as often in Vermont. Uh, we do ha have detections occasionally of anatoxin on the left there, circled in orange. Um, and there is a, another neurotoxin produced by cyanobacteria known as BMAA that can also be uh, detected sometimes. There's a lot of research going on right now around BMAA. Uh, there are some scientists that believe it is connected to neurological disease like uh, Lou Gehrig's disease. The research in that field is still very much underway. and It's uh, not yet conclusively proved that, that those neurological diseases are connected to BMAA, but we watch that research closely. Two other compounds produced by cyanobacteria are also of interest. Uh, there are compounds known as dermatoxins that cause skin irritation and skin rashes. And then there are taste and odor compounds that are of interest uh, to water uh, treatment facilities, water drinking water facilities. Um, they can be produced by cyanobacteria as well. On the left side of the slide, you can see four organism names, genera, Anabina, Aphanosomenon, Microcystis, and Oscillatoria planktothrix. Pictures of those are, are along the bottom. And then you can see that there's a series of X's associated with each of those names. Those X's indicate um, whether or not that particular cyanobacteria can produce that uh, compound. And you can see that some, like Anabina, are capable of producing many different compounds. Others, like Microcystis, may only produce one or two. Just about every cyanobacteria has the ability to produce uh, one of these compounds. Interestingly, not all of them can. Um, they do not have the genes, for example, to produce microcystin. That can vary within the species, I mean within the genus. There are some species of microcystis that can produce microcystin and others that cannot. Um, it's not possible to tell by looking at a cyanobacteria, either with the microscope or with your eyes, whether or not those toxins are present. Interestingly, uh, even if a cyanobacteria does have the gene that allows it to produce a toxin, it doesn't always produce that toxin. It isn't always toxic. We don't know why. Um, we, there are a lot of theories about why cyanobacteria produce these compounds, um, but we don't fully understand it. And because we don't fully understand it, we can't predict when toxins might be present. And as I noted, we can't tell by looking that they might be present. The end result of that is that we recommend everyone should avoid contact with cyanobacteria because you cannot tell by looking whether or not the toxins are present. To be safest, it's best to avoid contact with them whenever you see them. Symptoms of exposure in people include rashes and skin irritations, allergy-like symptoms uh, like runny noses and sore throats. There can be stomach problems like diarrhea and vomiting, uh, there may be liver damage, numbness in fingers and toes, and dizziness. These are very potent toxins. Um, it is possible for a person to be exposed and get enough of a dose of, of, of a cyanobacteria toxin to cause a very severe illness and even death. 
Uh, death is rare, but it has occurred. Um, the, the one instance that I am aware of, um, which I believe may be the only one confirmed, occurred in Brazil back in the 1990s when a hospital kidney dialysis uh, water system was contaminated with microcystin. Uh, the dialysis patients that came in and were given treatment at that time were exposed to microcystin, and many of them died as a result. Um, so these toxins are potent enough to cause very serious health effects, um, uh, but, but those reports in people um, at this point are rare. The allergies and skin rashes are more common. Uh, stomach upset may be more common. Um, but uh, we do, th these are very potent toxins and you do need to be careful around cyanobacteria. Pets and livestock are more likely to be seriously affected. Um, every year, uh, it's happened already now in 2020, every year I read um, stories of dogs that have died as a result of drinking water containing cyanobacteria or eating cyanobacteria material that's, that's washed up on the shore or is in floating in the water. Symptoms of exposure in animals include weakness and staggering, difficulty breathing, convulsions, vomiting, and diarrhea. And as I said, often in dogs in particular, it can lead to death. Um, the original name for anatoxin was very fast death factor. Uh, in, in cases like this, death can occur in a matter of minutes. So it's very, very important for those of you that are out with pets um, or have livestock uh, and, and livestock watering ponds um, that you're very much aware of where, what cyanobacteria look like so that you can protect your, your animals. Who's at the greatest risk? Most vulnerable are small children and pets, and that's for two reasons. The first is that their, their body mass is small. It doesn't take as much of a dose of cyanobacteria uh, to cause illness. The other is that they don't really care what they put in their mouth. Uh, small children, as you know, are, are always with their fingers in their mouths. They pick things up, they stick them in their mouths. Dogs, in particular, um, in particular, my dog uh, doesn't care what it eats, doesn't care how bad the water looks on a hot day. It's going to drink scummy water if it's thirsty. Uh, so really, those are th those, for those two reasons, uh, pets and small children are most vulnerable. You're at highest risk when you come in contact with or swallow water containing large amounts of cyanobacteria. The image of the young man swimming there in the middle of the screen in that very, very green water is the kind of situation we strongly recommend you avoid, uh, strongly, uh, the activity we strongly recommend you avoid doing. An individual cyanobacteria colony is a very small thing. It may not produce uh, much, it, it won't produce much toxin if the toxin is present at all. But when you have lots and lots of cyanobacteria in one place, enough to discolor the water, as you see here in the photograph, if cyanotoxins are present, this is a situation where there be, may be enough to cause you to get sick. Um, and that is why we really strongly recommend at this point you avoid contact uh, with that water. Conditions that encourage growth uh, are two primarily. Um, here in Vermont, we tend to find cyanobacteria blooms during the summer months, most of the, you know, mostly. Uh, and that's from mid-July into perhaps early or mid-September when the water is the warmest. That is not to say cyanobacteria are not present at other times of the year. They are. They're there all the time, but we don't always observe them because they're not um, as abundant. Cyanobacteria blooms have been reported under the ice in Vermont. Uh, so again, uh, they are here all the time, but it is primarily during the summer months when we're out actually on the water and recreating uh, that we get the most reports of bloom conditions. Nutrients like phosphorus and nitrogen are very important for cyanobacteria. All of us need these nutrients to grow. Um, cyanobacteria can only become abundant and dense if they have enough nutrients to support that growth. Here in Vermont, we tend to find our most long-lived, dense, um, extensive blooms on lakes that have high nutrient levels, have high levels of phosphorus. Um, that is not to say that a bloom will not occur on a lake that doesn't have a lot of phosphorus. Blooms will occur on oligotrophic lakes, but they tend to be very short-lived. They're often very localized, um, and they're not nearly as dense as something that you will see on a, a high-nutrient lake. 
So overall, the management of nutrients, the reduction of the amount of phosphorus flowing off the land and into our waters is the best way that we can control cyanobacteria. If we don't feed them, they can't grow. The third thing here on the slide, calm waters, is not necessarily a growth factor, but more of an environmental condition. Some cyanobacteria have within, themsel within their cells, cells, very small gas vacuoles, small air bubbles that help them move. Um, they can regulate where they want to be in the water by, by changing the pressure within these gas vacuoles. Under the right conditions, they can accumulate at the surface as you see here in the milk bottle. They do this to get closer to the surface so that they can do better photosynthesis. But there are times when perhaps they might choose to be deeper in the water column um, where they can get more nutrients, for example. So they can choose where they want to be to a certain extent. These are very small organisms. They're not particularly powerful swimmers. Um, again, they're just floating. Uh, so if there's a lot of wind and waves or turbulence from motorboat activity, they will be stirred into the water rather than accumulating at the surface. So responding to cyanobacteria and, and protecting your health is about managing your risk of exposure, um, managing the chances that you will come in contact with enough cyanobacteria that it may cause uh, illness. We don't talk about risk management um, in those words very often, but we practice it every day. Uh, one prominent example is the fact that we get into our cars and, and don't hesitate to get onto the interstate um, and drive 70 or you know 70 miles an hour. And that's because we've taken a lot of steps to reduce the chance that we're going to have a serious accident and be injured in that accident. We ask people to have driver's licenses. We have signs and rules of the road that tell us how to behave when we're out driving our cars. We've built our cars so that they are strong um, and able to withstand an accident. We wear seat belts, we have airbags, um, we have you know, strong roller frames within our vehicles. We've done a lot to reduce the risk of a serious injury while driving our cars. I grew up in Tornado Alley. Uh, I learned to recognize the weather conditions that might lead to the formation of a tornado. Uh, I knew what to do when the sirens went off. Um, for those of us that boat or are on the water, on the ice during the winter, we recognize the weather conditions when it's safe to do those activities. Um, we, we wear things like life jackets and um, you know, other things to protect us while we're out there. And probably most relevant to cyanobacteria and the toxins that they may produce is the fact that we use a lot of chemicals and compounds in our homes that are also very, very toxic. Um, we get around the risk of becoming ill by following the directions and using them carefully. And the same is, the, the same is true for cyanobacteria. By recognizing what they look like, you can avoid contact and reduce the chances uh, of serious illness. So let's look a little bit at data that's been collected uh, over the last years using the visual assessment process. This data is from Lake Champlain. Uh, we categorize cyanobacteria into three groups, uh, generally safe, colored green here, which means there is uh, very little cyanobacteria present and recreation on the water is fine. There is uh, yellow for low alert conditions. Some cyanobacteria is present here, uh, not enough to, uh, enough that you should be cautious, but not enough necessarily to shut down recreation on that entire area. And then we have high alert, shown in red. There is a lot of cyanobacteria present at this time. Um, toxins may have been detected. Uh, recreation is not uh, recommended in this area. And as you can see, looking at the data from Lake Champlain, uh, most of the bars are colored green. We began using the visual assessment process in 2011. And since that time, we can say on Lake Champlain that Every summer, more than 80% of the time on Lake Champlain between mid-June and early September or mid-September, uh, generally safe conditions exist. So, so 80, more than 80% of the time on Lake Champlain, it is safe to recreate and there are no concerns regarding cyanobacteria. Every year we have locations that do have blooms uh, and other locations that infrequently have blooms. So there are times when recreation is not 
uh, recommended on areas of Lake Champlain, but in most cases, Lake Champlain is safe for recreation. On inland lakes, we have some inland lakes where volunteers have been monitoring uh, for several years now, and we can look at similar patterns. Uh, on Lake Carmi, a very a high nutrient lake in northeastern, uh, northwestern Vermont, excuse me, um, cyanobacteria blooms are a common thing. Uh, you can see that each year there's a significant number of cyanobacteria blooms reported from that lake. Lake Memphremagog also has cyanobacteria blooms, um, perhaps not uh, at the same frequency that you see on Lake Carmi in any given year. Shelburne Pond is another location where cyanobacteria blooms are observed frequently. Lake Iroquois uh, is one where we see cyanobacteria blooms occasionally. Not all lakes in Vermont are monitored. Um, so we do not have this information. It's one of the reasons why we encourage people to uh, become familiar with what cyanobacteria look like so they can make uh, determinations on how to use the water at the time when they're there. Again, I want to emphasize that conditions vary each year from lake to lake uh, and within a lake from year to year. Uh, this data is from 2015. The top graph is Lake Carmi, and you can see there that low alert conditions occurred a few times over the summer in 2015 on Lake Carmi. On Missisquoi Bay, which is on Lake Champlain, the middle graph, you can see that alert level conditions started in mid-July and were present consistently through early September. St. Albans Bay, also on Lake Champlain, alert level conditions started appearing in late July and continued into mid-September. So conditions do change even on the same lake uh, from year to year and from place to place. Uh, so it's something to be aware of. All right, and with that, I will end training uh, part one. Please, again, do continue on to parts two and part three uh, to learn more about how to use the visual assessment system and how to get your data into the Vermont Cyanobacteria Tracker.